that's a great idea. I might hire these guys and leave my singing. How are you all doing today? What kind of pizza do you have today? What kind? Okay, I meant what, what brand? Papa John's. What time's lunch? Okay. I'm hungry early today. Papa John sounds good. All right. Let's stick around. Anyone give me their pizza? No? Maybe Brother Pearson might. I don't know. Would you? Yes? Just say yes. No, 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 no. Nothing like that. Just say yes. Thank you. You just gave me your pizza for the day. I appreciate that. All right. Psalm 50 today. Psalm 50. What time is chapel over? Whenever I want. 10.30? Okay. All right. Psalm 50. At Cornerstone, every Wednesday night, we're going through the Psalms, and so this past Wednesday was Psalm 50. And I'm not bringing this out of convenience. I believe there's great application for us here today, so uh, we're going to go back and look at it. We go verse by verse, so all 23 verses. We could be here for a while, and so maybe they can just bring the pizza to us. I don't know, but we'll see. Psalm 50, as you know, the Psalms, uh, some of them we know the uh, setting behind and the writer of that. Uh, this psalm in particular, um, it is given a title, but yet um, the, the setting is more focused toward God and not from man's point of view, as we'll see in the very first few words. And so we'll begin reading in Psalm 50, verse 1 to verse 6, and we'll look at three specific things uh, today, and we'll just go through verse by verse. A little bit different uh, type of message, but I think there's great application for us. And so uh, let, let's take some time. Let's pray. And as we get into this, uh, Easter Sunday was Sunday. I read the first three verses of our text, and the fire alarm went off in our church. And so that was interesting. Never had that happen before, right on cue. And so hopefully we can get past uh, the first three, and someone doesn't pull a fire alarm on me today. Uh, but that was an interesting day on Sunday. I hope you all had a great day, Easter Sunday, and the days that have followed have been exciting. We're grateful for all God's doing. But let's go to him in prayer and ask his blessings upon uh, this time we have together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I thank you for this school, for each uh, young person here today. And Lord, I know you have great things for their lives. Lord, I pray that they would be attentive and have an open heart to receive your word, but then also a heart to respond to it as we look at Psalm 50 today. And Lord, I ask your blessings upon this time once again in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 says, the mighty God, that's our title, the mighty God. It begins with the focus upon God. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. We want to get the text here and to whom it was written. We know it's referring to the mighty God, but we see in verse number seven, he says, hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. In this context here, he's speaking to Israel and speaking of the people that he has revealed himself to so that he can reveal himself through them to the world. And today, that's what God is doing in and through his local church. He has shown himself to us. And as we have received him and trusted him as Savior, he's given us his word to guide us, to be our authority. He desires to be shown through us. And it's our responsibility to show him to the world. And so that was what Israel's responsibility in the Old Testament was. But he makes mention here that he had given them uh, some very important things to live by so that when the world looked at them, they could see him showing through. But yet there was 
some things that had slipped. And so God was calling their attention, the mighty God. You say, uh, who, who is he that he can do this? Well, he is the mighty God. He is the one that has spoken from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof. He is the creator of all things. And he says in verse number four, the Bible declares that he may judge his people. In verse six, the Bible says, for God is judge himself. So I want you to see three things. First of all, today I want to see a summons from God, a summons from God. A few years ago, I was summoned uh, to the courthouse uh, to do jury duty. And we sat in a large room, and uh, one after one, they went through the, jewelry, uh, the ju uh, jury pool to be able to select some uh, to sit on that jury. And uh, everyone there had received a summons, but a lot of people wanted to get out. And it's funny, it kind of reminded me, probably some of their excuses are better than the ones that you may have come up with this year, uh, why to get out of uh, jury duty. Uh, some of them had involved their pets and animals. I can just think in the school, you know, my dog ate my homework. Uh, but uh, that, that excuse, teachers, does that ever work? I don't think that ever works. I do have a, a, a funny story uh, on that line. My daughter, when she first started uh, sixth grade, uh, her little brother, uh, who is now in first grade, though, he got a hold of her homework. She was at the table doing her homework. He got a hold of her homework. And he went to the room, and his initial instinct when she tried to grab it was he put it in his mouth. And when she grabbed it, it ripped. And so literally, I wrote a note saying her little brother ate her homework. And uh, that excuse, I think, actually worked that day. And so maybe, uh, teachers, close your ears for a minute. Maybe that'll work if some of you have little brothers or sisters that are toddlers, uh, that they ate your homework. Well, some of those excuses that were used uh, there that day in the courtroom for the judge, the judge would look up at them and uh, kind of in a, uh, uh, with a smirk on his face, release them from jury duty because of these excuses. Well, here we get a summons from God. And I do want to make note of this. When we get a summons from God, there is no escape. There's no way out. And we see that throughout Scripture that we know that two main judgments are coming. Now, God has judged his pe people, and rightfully so, all throughout history. The nation of Israel was judged. There were two great judgments brought against them. One from the north, the Assyrians came and uh, took uh, the northern tribes uh, captive. And then we know especially of the uh, tribes that were taken captive by the Babylonians, uh, Daniel being one of the, the main ones that you know of because of that. And so God has judged his people, but for all of, uh, of the people here today and for you and I, there are two main judgments coming. There's one that is referred to that we know of for believers as the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat, where there we will not be judged for our sins because as we looked at on Sunday, Jesus Christ took our place. He cried, it is finished, and he became our substitute for sin. And if you're saved here today, it's because you've placed your faith in him, you've trusted in him and what he has done for you, and you know him as Savior. And so you will not be judged there for your sins because he took that judgment for you, but you will be judged for what you've done as a believer. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 details some of that for us because Paul writes to that church and uh, to those Christian, first century Christians to declare to them about this judgment. He said every work will be made manifest. The word manifest means if you walk into a room that's dark, you turn on the light, things are manifest. It literally means to turn the light on. And God's going to turn the light on into our lives and he's going to reveal the motives. He's going to reveal what we've done for him, not just the work, but the why. He knows why we've done it and for what purpose. And so at the judgment seat of Christ, we'll be judged for the things that we've done as a believer, the opportunities that God has given to us. But also there's a judgment coming. The Bible refers to in the book of the Revelation that is the great white throne judgment. And that judgment will judge those that have not trusted Christ as their Savior. They've rejected him, and they have uh, sought to, to live a life that may be sincerely, uh, but whatever, whatever desire that they had, whatever means that they had, it wasn't by coming to God his way. And so they will stand before him to give an account. Some in the world today say, oh, I won't give an account before God. I'll never stand before God. Listen, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess Christ as Savior. 
And on that day, God will judge those for their sin. Now get the picture here, friends. You can never pay for your own sin. And so that's why eternity is forever. The word itself, eternity. Why? Because people will for eternity pay for something that can never be paid in full. Only Jesus Christ can pay that debt. And so if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, that is the judgment that is coming. There's two great judgments, and the Bible says that God is the judge. He is judge himself, and that he will judge his people. And so from this perspective forward, I want you to have in mind, though, the judgment that as his people, believers will face, okay? Because that is the perspective that this psalm takes throughout the remainder. So you know Christ is your Savior. You will be judged one day for the life that God has given to you, that you live for him, the opportunity. I think the greatest disservice and the greatest uh, or the worst question that you ever get asked and that's ever asked the young people is, what do you want to do with your life? I believe that needs to be turned around, and I believe the question we need to be asking you and that, that you need to answer is, what does God want for your life? Because when I say, what do you want for your life, it puts all the pressure on you, and it forces you to make a decision based on the flesh or maybe something that you see or maybe peer pressure around you. But when you ask, what does God want for your life, it gives you the opportunity to go to him and to pray and to seek him and to get godly counsel and to follow his word and his way to accomplish what he wants because one day you're going to stand before him. And I don't want to stand before him saying in my own strength and power, Lord, I, I, I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that when I know that he is all-knowing and that he is all-caring and that he can provide for me far greater than I could ever do for myself. And I have to stand before him and say, well, I did what I wanted to do. We want to stand before him and say, Lord, I tried by your strength and power, by your spirit to do what you wanted me to do. And if you'll live in that manner, you have little to regret. All of us, there's a song that says we'd wish we'd given him more. There's no doubt about that. I look at missed opportunities in my life in ministry that I regret. But I do see things where I've trusted God and God has given opportunity. And I stand here before doing what I do today with no regrets because I know this is what God wants. And so I encourage you in that way. Why? Because we, we will stand before God. We all have a summons from God. And there's no excuses that day. For the believer, there will be no excuses that day. For the unbeliever, there will be no excuses that day. There's a summons from God. He says in, after verse number 6, there's a sila there. There's a pause. He wants you to grasp that and think about that. But then we move forward and see from a believer's standpoint, what will that, ju the, that judgment look like? And I see, secondly, a sacrifice to God. A sacrifice to God. In verse number 8, we'll pick up there, and the Bible says, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goat out of thy fold. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Let me pause right there. Understanding the Old Testament, I'm sure you've got uh, somewhat of a grasp of this, that God had given the law through Moses, and through that there was a sacrificial system that was established where people could bring forth the sacrifices that was required of God, some every year, and there was a very uh, 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 ceremonial process that took, pl took place because that's what God had required. And so before we look down upon the law and that ceremonial process, we have to say, look who gave it. God gave that to show his people, first of all, their inability to earn or gain perfection that God required. You say, why did God require that? Because he is holy and just. But it also his people to show them that they needed to trust him. And so the sacrificial system was set up by God, given to his people. But he says right here, I'm not, I'm not looking at that. I'm not looking for those things because he says in verse number 10, notice the words, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? 
Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. What God wants, and yes, he wants our sacrifice, but he wants it to come from a pure heart. There is no substitute. You can do the right things and sacrifice, but what God wants is the right way and the right motive. Do you get that? Yes, God, it's important to God that the sacrifice was brought and how he gave it to them, how that they were to bring that. I think of the first Passover back when it was established. Moses gave it to the children of Israel when they were in Goshen. And they were to put the blood on the doorpost and on the, on the top, the lintel and the doorpost on the sides as God had commanded them. And that was very important that they followed those directions. But what was the most important is they did it with a heart of belief and they did it with a heart to, to trust God and to obey him. That was what was most important. The Bible declares when Samuel came to Saul, he said to obey is better than sacrifice. Is the sacrifice important? Yes, but the obedience is what God is looking for. Doing it out of a heart and desire to please him and to glorify him. In the book of James, we're told, and we know that faith is important, but faith without works is dead. You can have works without faith, but you'll never have faith without work. And works are a show and a sign of your faith. They're they're, they're there to, to show forth to God of what he has done in our lives. But works without faith is just a show of an individual, of what they have done. Faith without works is dead. What am I saying here, and what is God saying here to us? He says that he doesn't need the, the fowl of the air. He doesn't need the beast of the forest. He says, if I need all of that, it's already mine. I want you to grasp this, this very... Strong point right here. If you get something, get this right here. Everything in this world is already God's. You're not going to ever give to him something that's not already his. When we, it's amazing, uh, when, we, when we give at church, sometimes we talk about, we hear testimonies of people giving and giving sacri sacrificially. Actually, we're never giving back to God something that's not already his, that he's not already given to us. It's amazing, part of the grace of God it is God gives us the grace to earn and gain. And then when we give to him and are found obedient, he blesses us for it. So it's actually a twofold blessing. He gives it in this direction, and then when we pass it on, he gives it back and blesses it. And that's how God desires to work. That's what God wants to do in your life. But all of this is already his. He's given it all. He's given you life. He's given us all things. And so sacrifices are not acceptable when God is the one, when God is not the one honored and his glory is not the goal. Let me say that again. Sacrifices are not acceptable when God is not the one honored and his glory is not the goal. It's our desire to honor the Lord with our substance, with the first fruits of all of our increase. His glory should be our goal. You say, how can I tell? How can I look at my life right now and see, am I honoring God? I want you just to, this litmus test of this. When you talk about the things that you've done, do you say, I have, or do you say, God has? It comes out in our speech. It's just natural. It's amazing. A lot of Christians will come to me and say, Preacher, I, I've done this, and I, 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 I've done that. And, and I don't think they're really meaning to try to show forth pride, but sometimes it can come across as, have you done that? Is that your life, or is it what God has done through you? And it goes back to the question I, I said about asking young people is, what do you want for life, or what does God want for your life? Because, listen, you can graduate from a Christian school, you can go off to a Christian college, or whatever it is that you have an aspiration to go and, and to fill and do, and you can say, oh, look what, what's been done. And you could even tag on there, which is nice cliche to do, God has blessed me. 
And we've learned to use some of those little cliches and little quotes to kind of tag on when, when we've had this success and, and give it to God because that's what the other church people like to hear. That's what pastor likes to hear. But in your heart, is it because that you have done it or is it that you know this is what God has wanted me to do and God has done it through me? And oftentimes it comes out in people's speech. It just naturally comes out. I've done this, I've done that. Here, here, here's, here's what I can do. It ought to be, this is what God has done. This is what God can do. You see, he says, if I needed all of this, the sacrifice, if it were about the sacrifice, I've already got it all done. It's mine. What it's about is a heart that desires to have God's blessings and to honor him and glorify him. And so when we're called to judgment, the summons is given, and God looks at our life and what we've done for him. Have we done it for our gain, or we've done it for his honor and for his glory? And can I share something with you? It's been a lesson. It's been ups and downs. And if you ask any adult, I'm sure that they'll tell you the same, same thing around here. God has blessed, and no doubt I've seen God's blessing. But I've also been on the other side of doing things and being able to accomplish things in my own strength and power. And when you weigh the two, it's not even close. Living a life for self, living a life for your own purpose and your own ambition, there's no true fulfillment in that. It's always the next. It's always something else. When you live your life for the Lord and you know it's of him and you see God has worked in a way and it's indescribable, it makes such a difference in your life. You want to live for that. And so our sacrifice to be acceptable is to honor God and his glory. There's one verse, just maybe a page over, I want to give before we move to our third point. Psalm 51, verse 17, the Bible says, The sacrifices are God, of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. What he's saying there is he says the sacrifices of God, what God wants is he wants it to come from in here. Do you remember one of the first stories of the Bible, Cain and Abel? Do you remember those Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel? Some of you do. One or two of you do. All right. I'm glad. Well, Cain and Abel were required to bring sacrifices to God. And I believe with all my heart that Cain brought the very best that he had. And I believe that maybe he even brought more as far as quantity than Abel. Because what was asked was that sacrifice, that animal to sacrifice to God. And Abel brought of that, and he obeyed, and the Lord honored his sacrifice. But Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. He brought of his own labor. And the reason he was upset, because God rejected it, not because his labor was bad. I believe it was probably the very best that he had and the very best that he could do. And maybe in quantity it would outweigh Abel's. But it all boiled down to is, was it what God wanted? And the answer was no. So God rejected his sacrifice. He accepted Abel's. Why? Because the Bible says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. It's not what we want, it's what God wants. But when we give God what he wants, listen, the results are what we want. I've learned that what God gives in return and the opportunities that God gives, I could never have even imagined. And so we have a decision. What are we going to do with the life that God gives? We see what he desires here, the sacrifice. He wants us. He doesn't want what we can give to him. There's always going to be more talent. There's always going to be someone better. There's always going to be something of more value. But what God wants is you because no one can replace you. You are how God made you. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants you to honor and glorify him. Not some cheap substitute. He wants you. But we've got to watch 
in verse number 16, the Bible says, But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, and that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been a partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things thou hast done, and I kept silent. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. He reminds in verse number 21, the summons, judgment's coming. He has given about what he wants, what he declares, the sacrifices. What kind of sacrifices does God want? It's not the things because he already owns all the things. He owns the world. He wants you. He wants your heart. So we have to come down to make a decision. And what we see here is they've made the wrong decision. I see, thirdly, the sin of hypocrisy. We've seen a summons from God, sacrifices to God, but the sin of hypocrisy. It's hard sometimes to pick out a hypocrite. In verse 16, the Bible refers to, it says, but unto the wicked, God saith. Now, the wicked sometimes in Scripture are used to define those that are lost. They do not know Christ the Savior. But we can see in Scripture that saved people, believers, do wicked things. Okay? David here committed one of the sins that that are mentioned of adultery you know some of the sin that has been expressed in Scripture. And so saved people do wicked things. They do things that are against God and break his law. And here he mentions, uh, even seeing in verse number 18, it says, when thou sawest the thief, thou consentest with him. They're breaking some of the core commandments here. The Bible says, thou shalt not steal in the Ten Commandments. Here they said, when they saw a thief, instead of turning him in, they became an accomplice. He said, thou hast been a partaker with adultery. The Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. In verse number 19, he said, thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. And he's talking about speaking against his own brother. And the Bible says that we're not to bear false witness against our neighbor. And so here they're breaking some of the most familiar commandments. Some of the things that you know to do or you know you shouldn't do. But what happens in verse number 21, they put it all together like God was on their side, and that is hypocrisy. Notice there's a phrase right in the middle of verse 21. He says, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. And you may be able to fool everyone. You can fool a teacher, mom and dad, fool the youth pastor, fool your friends, and convince them, I'm like one of you. And maybe even get the idea that, that God, God's going to accept me because I've learned how to play the part. But here he's calling out that sin, the sin of hypocrisy. And he says in verse number 21, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. What's he saying? He says, I am going to reveal it. A hypocrite was an actor. He would wear a mask. God is saying here, I'm going to pull off the mask. You say, why? Because God is judge. And he says, everything's going to be made manifest. He says, this is what I desire. I desire a sacrifice out of a pure heart, not not from a hypocrite. And he says, those that are living in this, this sin, he says, I will reprove it. I'll make it known. And I'll show it. You think, I, I've gotten by with it all this year. No, because God already knows. It's time to stop pretending. It's time to get it right, because God already knows. Finally, there's a summary. In our last couple minutes, look at verse 22 and verse 23. He says, now consider this. He's bringing it all together. This is our conclusion. Consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver, 
What is it? You say, that sounds awfully harsh. No, actually, that's very loving. Because he's saying, consider this. He has given an opportunity to pause and to get things right. That's called the mercy of God. He says, lest I tear you in pieces. Meaning, I'm giving you a warning to get it right. Because remember, back at the very first, judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. God was very merciful to the children of Israel. He allowed things to go on for years, even generations. But God did bring judgment. And you may think, well, I don't know. I I know the Lord's coming back, but it may not be now. It may not. I don't know when it will be. You're right. We don't know when it will be. But God is a God of his word. And we do know one day we'll stand before him. He says, remember that. Consider it. Stop pretending. I'm giving you an opportunity. Get it right. Maybe there's something that happened this school year, maybe between a friend, maybe between the school, maybe between mom and dad. You need to get something right. God's given you this day, this space, that if he were to reveal it, Oh, it might be a blot on your character. It could hurt the future. God's saying, you have this moment to get it right. He said, whosoever, or whoso, verse 23, offereth praise glorifieth me. Meaning, you praise God, thank God, make it right between you and God. Offer praise to God. And to him that ordereth his conversation, the word conversation means your way of life. Get the picture. He says, first of all, you need to go make it right to God. In just a moment, we give an invitation. You need to make it right with God. But then he says, you order your conversation, meaning you need to make it right this way. He says, whosoever ordereth his conversation, your way of life, a right, will I show the salvation of God. Twofold thing. I'm done right here. If you're here today, maybe you've sat in youth group, maybe you've sat all year And truly in your heart, you've been convicted and you've never stepped out and trusted Christ as Savior. God's given you this day. You can't guarantee the next hour. You can't guarantee tomorrow. But judgment is coming, friend. And he says, I've given you an opportunity. I've given you this day for salvation. Salvation is a free gift. He's not asking you to work for it. He's not asking you to jump hoops to get it. He's asking you to come and receive it. If you're here and you're still wrestling with that and you don't have that settled, don't wait throughout this day. Get it settled in this hour. If you're a believer and you know Christ as Savior, judgment is still coming. We're going to be judged for what we've done in this life. And he says our conversation is ordered, meaning there's some things, and as we live our Christian life, how we should live, and God has given us his word, God has given us spiritual direction to help us and guide us. But maybe you've learned to just play the part. The sin of hypocrisy is becoming so real in your life. You know what to say, you know when to say it, but in your heart, you don't mean it. God has given you this day, and he is saying it's time to make it right. It's time to offer praise to God, make it right with him, and now it's time to turn that life and to get things right. It's time to start living with that right heart. Listen, young person, it's the most freeing thing that you could do Because right now, if you don't have a heart right with God, you're sitting there right now, and your heart's beating out of your chest, and you're you're knowing what you're doing. But the longer you go at it, the less you begin to feel that. And you begin to succeed without getting it right, and begin to think, I've got this. But God says, I will reprove. I'll make it known. Remember that. And God doesn't want to bring that judgment to hurt you. He wants to help you because he's got so much better for your life. So order your conversation. So would you bow with me in prayer? I think this is a very powerful psalm. Psalm written to Israel. We know, we can read about Israel's history. We know how much of it ended. We know that there was many good people that God used to reveal himself in and through. But there was many that 
rejected God. They played the part of hypocrisy. 